Hosea said, our mission statement is to help more people more often say yes, yes. to God. That word yes, you said it with enthusiasm. That, yes. that one yes. word, the word yes, is a powerful word. It is a powerful word. Uh, one yes can change everything about your life. I look back at my life, the times I've said yes, I shared with you last week some of those, you know, getting married, going to in a ministry, going to, to, call, or to Arizona to serve at a church. All these different yeses or huge yeses in my life changed the whole trajectory of my life and blessed me beyond my wildest imaginations. So you just need to know that when you say yes to God, he may begin taking you down a path of wonder, of beauty, and, and so many wonderful things in your life. And we've been looking at this character named Nehemiah from the Bible to learn some qualities about what it means to say yes. See, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, king of Persia, in the 5th century B.C. And Nehemiah was in Persia, in this capital city of Susa, because 150 years before, the Israelites had been so disobedient to God, had worshipped the false gods of the other nations, that God sort of threw his hands up and said, okay, you're not going to worship me, I'm giving you to the nations. And so Babylon came in there and destroyed Jerusalem, knocked down the temple, and then took captive the Jewish people, many of the citizens, and brought them into Babylon. Well, a couple of decades later, the king of Persia knocks off the Babylonian king, and in so doing, takes over all their territory. So now the, the Jewish people that have been transported into Babylon now are part of the Persian Empire, and Nehemiah is one of these men. He's a good man. He's a, he's a man of character, and he serves as cupbearer to the king. Now, that role is very significant because the cupbearer was the one who made sure that the wine and the food that the king was served was not poisoned. In fact, he would find out it was poison before the king did. And so he was a very trusted individual, and yet Nehemiah hears word of a, of a project that the king of Persia, after defeating the Babylonians, had initiated. He told the Jewish people that they could go back to their homeland and rebuild their temple and resume worshiping their God. I mean, this is amazing to think about this. Why would the king do that? What's, what's, what's it to his benefit? I don't know, but God put it in the heart of King Cyrus to send them back and help them to rebuild the temple. So they go back and they, they hit some roadblocks and it takes 20 some years, but they get the temple rebuilt. But there's a problem because around the temple used to be a, a, a high wall, a wall of protection and these tall, strong gates. So that the walls had been knocked down and the gates actually had been destroyed and burned with fire. And every time they tried to rebuild the walls, they were discouraged and never completed it. And so now it's 150 years later, the temple's rebuilt, but but the walls don't exist. And as I shared last week, it's sort of like for us today not having a front door on our house. I mean, you just feel exposed and vulnerable all the time. And so when Nehemiah hears this, it just crushes him. He gets down on his knees. It says he fasted and wept and prayed for days, for weeks. And then we get an insight into one of his prayers. It's a beautiful prayer. I think one of the greatest prayers of Scripture. He acknowledges first that God is the God of heaven, that God's sovereign, that he's in charge of everything, that God, that God knows what's going on in this world far better than we do. And we screw it up all the time. And the reason the Israelites were suffering was because they messed up. And so he confesses the sins that he and his forefathers had committed before the Lord. But then he remembers this. God made a promise. God promised them that if they disobeyed him and worshiped the false gods, they would be scattered among the nations. But God also said, if you return to me and repent of your ways, I will bring you back to this place. And Nehemiah says, God, I'm claiming that promise. And I'm confessing right now that we were wrong. And we want to do it your way. And I'm claiming the promise that you're going to bring us back and reestablish us. And then he says this. This is so cool. At the very end of the prayer, he says, God, give me favor before the king. In other words, here I am. If you can use me, send me. And we talked last week about that the first part of saying yes to God is, is yielding to him. And saying, here I am. Have, have with me. Whatever you want from me, I'm available. And that's what Nehemiah was doing. When you say yes to God, you are yielding yourself to his will. But there's another quality about saying yes to God I want to look at today, and it's the word expect. Because when you say yes to God, you can expect certain things to happen. I can promise you, most if not all the things we're going to look at today will happen to you when you say yes to God. 
And so if you have a Bible, you can open up. We're going to go back to Nehemiah, and this time we're going to start in the chapter 2, which begins like this. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. And then I was very much afraid. Now it mentions here the month of Nisan. When chapter 1 started, it was the month of Kislev. Now, if you go to the Jewish calendar, Kislev was around November, December of our calendar, and Nisan is um, March, April. So we're looking at a period of about four months from the time he heard the news about his ancestors in Jerusalem to now standing before the king. Four months. Four months of praying over this. Four months of agonizing over, over this. Four months of carrying this burden for his people. Nehemiah can't, can't keep it to himself. Now, he knows that when he comes before the king, he's got to put on a good face. I mean, that's what you do before the king. Do you know that kings in those days could just, they could take your head off like that? You looked at me wrong? Commander, take his head off. I'm not going to wipe the smile off your face. I'm going to take the head off the body. That's what I'm going to do. You, you had to behave well before the king because the kings were powerful and oftentimes ruthless. And so he was afraid because he had tried to hide it, but somehow the king detected, you look sad, and this looks like a deep kind of sadness. And Nehemiah is afraid of what that may mean for him. And he's also afraid that if he has to talk about it, the king may not like it because his mind for four months has not been about his job, it's been about his people. And there's a fear that if he tells the king, yeah, all this time I've been thinking about the, the Jewish people back in Jerusalem and how they're vulnerable, and the king says, you're not, you're not thinking about me, serving me, and I'm your king. Nehemiah's afraid. You can understand how he could be afraid. And you need to know this. Here's one of the things you can almost always expect. When, when you say yes to God, expect to confront your fears. You will have to face your fears. When God says, says follow me, you just know this is coming. You're going to have to go to a place you don't want to go. You're going to have to say something you don't want to say. You're going to have to do something you don't want to do. Be prepared to face your fears. When, when I was in college, I think I've shared this story before, but what, uh, some of you may not have heard it. When I was in Bible college, I had to take a class called homiletics, which is the art and science and skill of preaching. Now, I didn't want to take the class because I never wanted to be a preacher. I just wanted to do youth ministry stuff, and so, but I had to take this class. It was required class to take this 101 class. Now, the other students, well, some of them had wanted to be preachers since they were eight or 10 years of age. Some of them went to camps. Some of them went to events at Bible colleges where they actually gave sermons when they were 16 years of age. I mean, these, these boys in the class were preachers in the making. I, I, I was trying to get, get a B or C in the class and get it over with, and so I gave a sermon on Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. And then the professor said sometime a few weeks later, hey, I'd like you to go to this church in Iowa. They need someone to fill in for the pastor on a weekend. I'd like you to go and, and give your sermon. And I said, oh, okay, I guess I can. I didn't think much about it until we got close to that date, and then I got terrified. I said, I've never preached before people. I mean, those kids in my class were people, but I've never preached before a congregation. Oh, God, what did I get myself into? I don't want to do this. And I get to this church, and it's an old church. It's got this big uh, pulpit that looks like a chariot. I mean, you actually step into it like this, and it's wood. You're just way up above everybody. And uh, I kept looking for the horses. They're going to hook to this thing and take me off like Ben-Hur. So I step in this before service starts just to get a feel for it, and I'm even more scared now. Like, this is a position of authority. Who am I? This, this frightened little 19-year-old. And so uh, I actually go outside, and um, I leave my breakfast against the wall over there by the outside of the church. And I'm feeling sick, and I, says, I, I want to tell them I'm too sick to preach, but I can't. So I'll just get through this. And I got through it. I was terrified. I just, uh, you may think I mustered up this great courage. I did not. I was terrified the whole time. Get me through this, God. Get me through this, God. Okay, it's over. I'm going home. Never doing that again. Now, I don't get that scared on Sundays, but I have learned I don't eat breakfast before church on Sunday either. So, but I know this, 
When you say yes to God, just be ready. He's going to take you to a place of fear, a place that, that you don't like to go. And I don't know what your fear is. It may be public speaking. Your fear may be that hard conversation you need to have this, with somebody. Your fear may be writing that book and putting on in paper what God's put in your heart to write because other people are going to look at it and critique it and edit it. And you may be afraid of being a leader where God wants you to actually lead people. And you go, God, I don't want to do that. I'm afraid to do that. So I don't know what your fear is, but just know this. God loves you, and he wants you to grow, and he's going to take you to your place of fear. It goes on in the story. So he's afraid, and he says, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Nehemiah needed to open up and say what was going on inside of him, and you will as well. There may come a point where you're going to have to tell people what's going on in here or what's going on in here. They're going to want to know, why do you act the way you do? Why do you do those things with the church that you do? Why did you quit your job and go this direction or go back to school or go into ministry or to the mission field? Why did you do that? Why, why, do you, why do you go to that Bible study? And what's that all about anyway? And you're going to have to explain to people, maybe your family, maybe your coworkers, maybe your neighbors, why you do what you do. So he has to explain to the king what's going on in his heart. He's so, he's so wise. Because he starts off saying, oh, may the king live forever. When you, when you stand before a king, you don't start with you, you start with the king. When you stand before a king, you better start with the king and not you. I mean, that's exactly what Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. You come before the great king of the universe. You don't come in and say, hey, God, here's what I want. You come in saying, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I have needs, Lord, and I have needs for daily bread and forgiveness. And, but I start with the king. Amen. And so Nehemiah is very wise. He doesn't come in blurting out everything he needs. He says, oh, king, may you live forever. May the assassins not get to you. And then he says, I'll tell you what's going on inside. Jer Jerusalem, the place where my father and grandfather and great-grandfather were buried, it's not doing so well. <laughs> I like how he even phrases it. Like, how can the king get upset about the place where your ancestors are buried? It's like, like me wanting to go back and watch a Chicago Cubs game in Chicago, but I say, hey, um, elders, could I get a week off to go back? I want to visit my dad's grave. While I'm there, I'll pick up a game, but, but how are you going to say no to that? <laughs> how are you going to say no to Nehemiah? Man, my heart's just, it's a place where my family's buried. It's just all destroyed and ruined. He doesn't come out and say, I want to go back there and build Jerusalem back up again so it's a dynamic power and and threatens the, the, the nations around them. No, he just says, I just want to go back and humbly rebuild the place where my ancestors were buried. So he opens up his heart and asks, presents that to the king. There are times when people ask you the questions about you and your faith, and you need to be ready to explain yourself. See, we're told that in 1 Peter chapter 3. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asked you for a reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared. If someone were to ask you, why do you go to church? Why do you worship? Why do you listen to that music? Why, why do you give? You know, why do you serve so many hours for the church? You, you ought to be able to explain why you do it. I mean, I've had to um, do that a lot in my life. Why, why am I a Christian? Maybe why am I, why am I a pastor? And I just have to say, I've got, I, I know my answer real well. Christianity, walking with Jesus, gives me the most satisfying answers to the biggest questions I have. Where did I come from? Why am I here? How am I supposed to live? Where am I going? Why is the world the way it is? Why is it so broken? And how do we fix it? All those questions I find answered in the scriptures and in a relationship with Jesus. The biggest questions of life. They're answered right there, and so I found so much peace in it that I, I not only want to live that in my life, I want to tell other people about it because I haven't found any other answer in life other than Jesus. 
I was looking at a mango this week, cutting up a mango for breakfast, and I just looked at that mango and said, do people really believe that somehow in ancient time, uh, uh, some cells evolved to create a plant, and that plant had the intelligence to say, not only will we create a tree, we're going to create a tree that has baby mangoes on it. And those mangoes have seeds to enable more mango trees. I mean, how did it even think that way unless there was a God who made it? I mean, God explains. There's still questions in life, but I can't find any more satisfying explanation than God. And so you need to come up with your own answers. Why do you do what you do? Why, why do you come to church on Sunday morning? Why do you pray? Why do you read your Bible? Know your answer. And you'll get a chance. God will give you a chance to speak to that. So here's what Nehemiah goes on to say. Then the king said to me, so what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, there it is again, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, and the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river. That, the beyond the river is the land west of the Euphrates River. So if you know Middle East geography, there was where Euphrates River used to be the boundary for Babylon until they took over. And now this other new area, the area where the, the Jewish people had the promised land, that's just simply called beyond the river. So... Send me, so when I get to the beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. This is one of the most exciting things. When you say yes to God, expect to see amazing answers to prayer. Expect to see amazing answers to prayer. Remember Nehemiah's prayer request from last week? God, give me favor before the king. It's being answered right here. <laughs> he, not, he not only has favor, he has the king's undivided attention. I mean, think about it. Think, think of how incredible this is. This is the king of Persia. A, the, the Persian empire at that time stretched from modern-day India all the way west, upward to where Greece is and down to where Egypt was. It's a massive piece of land. It was the largest kingdom in that area of that time. And this king has people stationed all over these provinces, governors and leaders to be his eyes and ears to know what's going on. And not only that, he had a, a bodyguard composed of 10,000 elite soldiers. They were called the immortals. Because in those days, you can just read about it, people were constantly assassinated. And the next guy would step up. Usually a military leader would step up. And take over for the king. And so he's got all this, these highly trained people, 10,000. Here's what I learned about that group, by the way. If, if one of them got sick, they replaced him. They always had 10,000 exactly. If one died, they replaced him right away. 10,000. 10,000. Our president doesn't have 10,000 bodyguards. But this king did. And the guy that holds the plate in the cup comes in and gets the attention of this king. This is, this is phenomenal. This little guy who's not even Persian has a cup and a plate and, and says, I've got the king's, and the queen's sitting right there. They're looking at me. They're asking me these questions. God is doing something amazing. And so what he does, immediately prays. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, he's standing there. It's not like he got on his knees and prayed, or excuse me, I need to go off and pray somewhere. He, he probably didn't raise up his hands. I don't even think he prayed out loud. I think it was one of those inside prayers. He's standing before the king. The king says, what are you requesting? So I prayed. Because what comes out of his mouth next is so important. And by the way, I think we would be very wise to pray before we speak. Whether it's to your spouse, to your kids, to your boss, to the person that bothers you, that you pray before you speak. Because we need God to guide this instrument called the tongue. And Nehemiah knows, I could ask for too much and offend the king, or I could ask for too little and not have what I need to get the job done. What's he going to do? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray to the God of heaven because he's put me in this place. Surely he'll guide me. He'll help me to know what to do. And so he begins to present his request. 
Hudson Taylor, who was a great missionary to China, said, it is possible to move men through God by prayer alone. And you see God doing that all through history. God working through people sovereignly in response to the prayers of his people. So he says, and again, very tactfully, if it pleases the king, and if he's found favor with me, here's what I like. So he starts with saying, basically, king, it's, uh, it's going to be your choice, but here's what I'd like. Now, I, had a, I had a staff member come to me recently, and, and that's, this person said, um, hey, boss, I'd like to uh, take this certain day off, but um, if you need me, then, then I'll be here. Well, it's hard to say no to a request like that. No, no, go ahead. I appreciate that. Take that day off. See, he, he's approaching the king very tactfully, but at the same time, very boldly. He says, I'm going to need some time. He's going, how much time? Uh, so he said a time, probably several months. I'm going to need a lot of time to go back there because this is going to take a little bit. So um, I need time. And then he says, and while you're at it, I could use some letters. I could use some letters to the governors of that area because they're going to question why I'm, why I'm back here and I need letters from you saying that you have sent me. And one more thing. Um, could you have Asaph, the guy over the forest, um, to provide me timber because I've got to rebuild some gates and build a house for me while I'm working there? And the king said yes to all of it. All of it. All of it. It reminds me of James chapter 4. Verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. I could guarantee you this, if Nehemiah had not asked, he would not get. Now, he might have asked and not got everything he asked for, but I know the opposite. If you do not ask, you're likely not going to get it. So he kind of says, hey, king's asking me, I'll just put it all out there. Worst thing that could happen is he says, no, you can have the time, but I can't do anything else for you. Best thing, he could do all of it, which is what he did. And you know why he did that? You know why the king did that? Nehemiah says it real clearly. Because the gracious hand of God was upon me. The good hand of God was on me. I mean, it's, he's answering prayers. He's answering his prayers. When you say yes to God, just know this, God's going to do some amazing things and answer to prayers, things that will blow you away. And Nehemiah is prepared. I'm sure over those four months of praying, he began to think, here's, if I go back, he says, yes, here's... Here's some of the stuff I need. Because sometimes people, well-meaning, will say, hey, just trust God. Don't do any planning. Just trust God. Someone asked me once, Pastor, why don't you just pray all week for Sunday sermon, but don't write anything down. Don't, don't put anything on paper. Just trust that on Sunday morning when you wake up and you step in the pulpit, God will give you a message. I said, I, I, I just don't feel comfortable doing that. I said, because I pray that God speaks to me on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday before I go to the pulpit on Sunday. I don't want to, make, I don't want to show up Sunday morning and make a fool of myself, possibly. It's not that we shouldn't be open to the movement of the Spirit, but I'm just saying, do the best you can in planning and then allow the Holy Spirit to intervene and change things if needed. But don't say, I'm not going to plan because I'm trusting God. God honors the plans because when the door opened, Nehemiah knew exactly what he needed. Then we go on to another thing that he found he needed. He actually got into Jerusalem, and it was nighttime, so he mounted a horse, and he began to ride around the city looking at the ruins to assess how bad it was. I mean, it's been 150 years. And there's one place where he can't even get the horse through because it's so narrow. The, the boulders have fallen down, and... You know, people have gotten used to living around that. You know, you kind of just, yeah, that's just the way it is. Have you got things in your house where you just kind of, that's, yeah, we just gotten used to that broken door handle or that thing over there doesn't work or, you know, you have to use your screwdriver to hit this thing to get this, the, the lawnmower to start. You know, we get used to working around the problems, the things that aren't fixed, and then someone comes in with fresh eyes and they go, hey, that needs to be fixed. We could fix that pretty easily. And Nehemiah looks, it's 150 years, it's never been fixed. He says, I think we can do this in a few months. So he assesses it, and then he's going to go tell his people. And why this is so important is because for those who are in positions of leadership, you've got to assess situations. You've got to be able to stand back and look at the bigger picture of what needs to be done. And that's what Nehemiah does. So then he gathers together different leaders 
within the community that are going to work on the building project. And in verse 17 it says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words of the king had spoken to, that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. You can expect when God uh, takes you down this path of saying yes to him that you will have to enlist others. Very likely, you will have to communicate to others to get them to go along with you. Nehemiah can't, can't do this on his own. In fact, I would tell you, Nehemiah did not go back there to build the wall. He went back there to have the wall built. Now, there's a difference from doing the wall and having the wall built. Because here's where so many people mess up is, I've got to do this thing when God says, no, you don't. You just have to see that it gets done. When I was in children's ministry, my former church, I learned very quickly that that. I can't do it all by myself. I can't be in the nursery, the preschool room, the the early elementary room, the older element. I can't be in all those places at the same time. I've got to build a team together. As much as I want to minister to kids, my job is to see that kids are ministered to. And we have a great children's pastor in our church named Pastor Jace. He's probably uh, one of the best at working with kids. But I'll tell you this, he's even better at rallying other people around him who love kids and will minister to them. And by doing so, he's able to expand the ministry. See, there are many times where you have to invite others to be part of it because it's too hard by yourself. It's too exhausting by yourself. And it's not fun doing it by yourself. Nehemiah has to be able to stand back and be the one who continues to cast vision when they're discouraged because they will get discouraged. And we're going to see as you go through the story, they'll get discouraged. And Nehemiah will stand back and keep motivating them and telling them to keep moving forward, see the bigger picture. And, and you need to know this too, with Nehemiah, he doesn't just invite them into the project, he gives them a reason. Don't just give an invitation to serve, give a reason to serve. And the reason Nehemiah gives them is, it will end the derision of our people. They will not be the laughing stock of the nations around them. Well, that, that's, a, that's a cause worth standing up for, that's right. See, I can invite you to work in a ministry, say, work with the kids, but isn't it better to say, why don't you come change the future of a kid's life? Isn't that a cause worth investing your life for? Not changing diapers, not handing out papers, no, this vision for something bigger. And maybe you don't have have to recruit volunteers because maybe your team is your family. When we... um, decided that God was calling us to move up to Colorado Springs from Arizona, we had to go back home and sit our kids down and say, we're going to move. And we're going to leave the church we love and the people that we've grown up with that you love, and we're going to leave them behind and go 800 miles north to a city called Colorado Springs. And their response was tears. And we had to work with our kids to get them to want to go with us. Maybe, maybe it's God's calling you to do something. You have to have a Long conversation with your spouse about, about that, to bring them along. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe it's with the bigger family. But you've got to be able to enlist others in your vision. And then finally, one other thing. story doesn't end without this. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? You just know And when you say yes to God, you better expect there'll be resistance. There will be people who will not like what you're trying to do. There will be people who will say, that's never been done before. That can't be done. You're not the one to do it. Who do you think you are? And they'll call you crazy. They'll call you weird, bizarre. And that's what they called Wilbur and Orville Wright when they said, we believe a man can fly like a bird in a plane. (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah, right. Now we take it for granted. They're heroes. They're icons. We look at a guy, modern day, Elon Musk, who says he believes there'll there'll come a day when most of our vehicles will not be powered by gas, but by electricity. We laugh at it. And now the Tesla's being being mass produced. And he's considered a genius. You know, if everything in your life is logical and makes sense, I, I just have to conclude, you're probably not walking by faith. If the people around you just see, see your life as very tame and logical, particularly the people that aren't Christian, then you're probably not walking by faith because when you walk by faith, you'll be stretched to do things, to go down paths that sound a little bit weird, that sound a little bit 
unusual. And people will call you crazy and they'll oppose you. We already know we have opponents like Satan. We have our critics. But sometimes those critics may be in your very own family. They may be people in your own church. Paul, Paul knew that he was called by God to take the gospel to the Gentiles, but he also knew this. He says, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective work is open to me. Man, all this, all this opportunity for evangelism is right before me, so that's what I'm going there to do. And then he adds, and there are many adversaries. There are going to be people who don't like it, who are opposed to what I'm doing. When you say yes to God, you can expect a lot of things to happen. You can expect to be play, taken to the place of your fears. You can expect to open up your heart and share what's going on. You can expect to see God do great and amazing things. You can expect that you'll have to mobilize others to go along with you. And very likely, you can expect opposition. It all comes with your yes to God. But you know, it's very much similar to a marriage. If you've been married, you've probably stood on an altar with your mate and you made a vow for better or for worse, knowing that marriage isn't always blissful. There's some very hard times. There's some very difficult times that come with marriage. And I'm just telling you, when you say yes to God and you make that vow, yes, God, there's going to be some very beautiful, ecstatic, wonderful, memorable times and there'll be some of the hardest times you've ever gone through in your life. But here's, here's my fear. Some of you, when you go through those very difficult times, will say, well, then God must not be with me. God must not be behind this. And the very fact you're going through those hard times may be validation that you are on the right path. Maybe the reason you got people who say it can't be done is because you actually are on the right path. And some of you are on that right now. You're dealing with that wrestling. God, am I, did I make the right decision? What did I get myself into? And I just want to urge you again. You said the big yes. You already said the big yes. The next ones are coming. Just keep saying yes. God, what's my next step? What's my next step? What's my next step? I'll promise you this. It will be good. It will be great.